good evening and God bless you. We're delighted to have you with us here this evening. Perhaps this is your very first time tuning in. We're delighted to have you and extend a warm welcome to you. We trust that you're greatly blessed with what you hear tonight. Tonight, we're gonna to pull something out of the archives on the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Very important in this hour. God bless you as you watch this. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Well, we are delighted to have you with us here um, tonight. We wanna to draw your attention to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter number four, and we are going to begin reading in verse number four. 1 John four, and starting in verse number four. The Bible says, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. How often we quote that. I love that scripture, praise God. Verse number five, they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. But this is what I wanna focus on is verse number six. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Now, who is the us that is being referred to here by John the Revelator. It happens to be apostolic believers. We are not talking about a broader denominational spectrum. We are not talking about a religious spectrum. You are talking about a bona fide apostle, an eyewitness of God's glory. And so he is talking about the church of the living God that is experienced exclusively. And I say that using 21st century um, conditions exclusively apostolic believers, those that have repented of their sins, been baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of their sins, and those that have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in other tongues. John the Revelator was absolutely an apostle. And there, at this present time, when he wrote this particular passage of scripture, there were no other denominations, there were no other um, leanings that were valid. There was only one valid gospel and there was only one valid message and it was apostolic. Let's continue to read. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us and he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error. That is what I wanna to talk to us about for a few moments here tonight. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The word error here simply means fraudulent, that which is, uh, that which is just not true. It doesn't have verity. It is, it is untrue, it is, not, it is not reality. And in an extrapolated form, the word means deceit, to deceive, and delusion. The, the spirit of error encompasses the word delusion. You know, we as human beings, a large component of our nature is invisible. When you're at looking at me tonight and I'm looking at a camera, you're only able to see the physical form of who I am. But this is just a house, this is a shell in which the invisible part of my life dwells. And therefore, the most important aspect of who and what I am responds and receives information that is invisible. And so the spirit of truth and the spirit of error is an extremely important subject that needs to be talked about. It. And some of these things are in full bloom and blossom in the 21st century. So let's talk about this. It is possible to believe something so strongly and yet completely be in error. You know, this is, this is difficult for a lot of people. And it's difficult because of the pride, the human pride of human beings. You know, 
the scripture talks about the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eye being three of the very strongest components of our fallen nature. And I have found that religious pride can sometimes provide such a impenetrable um, fortress of darkness in a person's life. They can, they can believe something so strongly because maybe their parents believed it, maybe their grandparents believed it, maybe they were raised in a particular persuasion, but because it's them and because it's theirs, they don't wanna believe anything else. They believe it to be absolute truth. I'm hoping that by the end of this short lesson here tonight, that you're going to understand and comprehend some things about the spirit of truth and the spirit of error that perhaps you've never considered before. This actually be begins in the book of Genesis, chapter number six. And we're going to look at this passage of scripture. If you have your Bibles and you're watching this tonight, Let's turn to the book of Genesis chapter six and begin reading in verse number five. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The imagination of man's heart was only evil continually and God saw the wickedness. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. But go back to verse number three. In light of what we just read there, verses five, six, and seven, look at verse number three. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. The word strive there, one of the words that is used to describe this word strive is to reason. Remember in the book of Isaiah, it said, come let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And so verse number three, before there is absolute judgment pronounced, global judgment, global cataclysmic judgment upon the entirety of the human race because of their unchanging condition. God said, he said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, which meant that God attempted to reason, to influence, to communicate, if you will, with the human race but ultimately concluded in man's wickedness that God looking past the acts of wickedness and he saw the inner mechanism of man that only and always the imagination of men's heart was only and always evil continually. So there was an interaction at some point, there was some degree of influence in which the spirit of truth, if you please, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God, that began to move on the face of the deep, verse number two of Genesis chapter number one. God's spirit was already in the world as an active agent. But God's attempt to influence humanity failed. And so God made a determination and a decision to destroy mankind. The Bible talks in Genesis chapter number 16, which we're, where we want to park for some time if you have your Bibles open. Now, the Holy Ghost is being introduced in several scriptures in this incredible discourse of Jesus. John chapter number 14, John chapter number 15, and John chapter number 16. In John chapter 14, verse number 26, he is revealed as a comforter. In John chapter number 15, he is revealed as a comforter. And then in John chapter number 16, beginning in verse number seven, listen carefully, Jesus speaking, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter, the comforter 
will not come unto you. It's already been revealed in John chapter 14, verse number 26, that the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. But here again, it's being used in the context. There is going to be an extrapolated understanding of the fact that the comforter is more than just he that wants to wrap around you and he that wants to console you and he that wants to be an advocate for you. All of these, of course, are meanings for the word comforter, which is the Greek word parakletos. But it goes beyond just a comforter. He is actually known as the spirit of truth. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. When he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So the comforter is more than just somebody that's here to comfort the woundedness, the hurts, and the fallenness of humanity. But there's a much greater purpose to the purpose of the comforter. And when he has come, he will com he will convict, which is the direct meaning of the word reproof. He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. If I could, if I could somehow coalesce all of this and bring it and compress it down to just a very understandable purpose, it would be this, that not only is the comforter given to console the individual, but also it's here to instruct us or to convict us of what is wrong, to instruct us what is right, and to bring about judgment for the prince of this world is judged. I wanna say that once again. The comforter not only is here to console and to be an advocate for the church of the living God and to those that receive him, but also to convince us of what is wrong in our life, to instruct us of righteousness and to bring judgment of all those areas where the devil may be influencing the individual life or to understand principles because this the prince of this world is judged. Let's continue on. We're gonna come back to that. Let's continue on here. How be it when he, the spirit of truth is come? I thought we were talking about the comforter. I thought we were just talking about feeling good in God. That's all part of it. But there is a much broader and much bigger purpose to the comforter, the Holy Ghost, than just feeling good. God has an intention. God has a purpose for us receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost and for it being described as a comforter. And this is the nucleus of that, is that God's ways will, will become my ways. God's will will become my will. God's word will be the govern, governing agent in my life. And that happens by, my, by me understanding that he is the spirit of truth. Let's continue to read this. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. Now we have not just something that feels good and not just something that's gonna convict and something that's gonna instruct and something that's gonna bring judgment. Now he is going to direct me. He's going to be a guide. He's going to lead me. It continues on. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever that which he heareth, he shall also speak. So there is an audibility. There is a audible aspect of this that is being incorporated with the inner ear of my spirit man. And he continues on. And he will show you things to come. So there is a optical part of my inner man that will also be activated by the spirit of truth. All of this, I believe, is what the Bible includes when it says the spirit of truth. 
I do not believe that you can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and not receive the spirit of truth. I do not believe that you can speak in other tongues, which is evidence of the infilling of the Holy Ghost, and then say, well, I've never received the spirit of truth. I believe it's all the same. But this is a little bit, this is now the Holy Ghost is setting up shop. It's setting up residence. It's literally taking up residence in a human life, and it's now going to work. It's now operating in the life of an individual that says, I've given it all to God. And now the spirit of truth is going to go to work. I've already mentioned that the spirit of truth is first introduced as a comforter. Let's talk about this conviction. This conviction or this reproving, I've already mentioned the very first aspect is going to be, it's going to convince us of things in our lives that are now inconsistent with not just the word of God, but the presence of God. There are some things that cannot coexist with the presence of the Holy Ghost in my life. And so I have to make some choices. This is, this is us recognizing that my, my choices are going to be allowing God to work in my life. I want the spirit of truth and I don't want just the spirit of truth so that I can run the aisles and I can feel spiritually intoxicated and I can, I can, I can feel good and I, I'm experiencing that redemptive lift. That's all part of it. But the reality of it is, is the spirit of truth is looking forward to eternity. It's looking to an eternal weight of glory. It's looking to this grand occasion that's described in First Thessalonians chapter number four, when we shall rise together to meet them in the air. And we're going to live forever with Jesus Christ. And so there is a, there is a eternity that is being processed here by allowing the spirit of truth to work in my life. It's amazing uh, through the years as a pastor, how many people I've come in contact with that said, oh yeah, I have the truth and I have the spirit of truth. Um, one of these occasions comes to mind. Uh, there was a woman that came here years ago and was trying to tell me that, oh yes, I have truth and I have the Holy Spirit and I'm called to be a missionary to Africa. When we stepped outside, uh, just through the course of ending a church service, uh, this individual reached into her purse and pulled out a pack of cigarettes and lit up a cigarette and began to tell me, oh yeah, it was told to me in another church before I came to Cornerstone that I was definitely going to be used of God and I was going to be a missionary in Africa and all these kind of things. I had some obvious flags rise because until you have allowed the spirit of truth to eliminate certain things in your life. Most notably, nicotine will kill you. It's a medical fact that the smoking of cigarettes can lead to lung cancer. And so in cleaning out the temple, that is one of the very first things that the Holy Ghost will do is to convict us of uncleanness and unclean living. But here was an individual that was looking all beyond that, looking beyond the habits of daily course of living and saying, in my future, I'm going to be a missionary. I had a problem with that. In fact, that was all I needed to reveal to me that this individual did not have the spirit of truth. You say, well, pastor, maybe that really was from God and was looking at her future even beyond the fact that she was smoking cigarettes. The spirit of truth will work in tandem as I allow God to work in the small incremental adjustments in my life. If I'm unwilling to just give up cigarette smoking, it's highly unlikely that God is gonna show me the panoramic apostolic usage of my life. I hope that's, I hope that's uh, a help to people out there that are watching because in, in contrast, the charismatic world operates on having what God sees me to be right now without any type of process before there can be any fulfillment of potentiality, there has to be the willingness of process. And process is the forgotten element in the charismatic church. They want to see the total five-fold calling, but they misunderstand the absolute necessity of process. The Bible describes process in its, 
in 1 Peter 2 and 2, it talks about newborn babes. Then it talks about that we are the children of God and then we must put away childish things and then we must be sons. And so there is a process. Make no mistake about it. And the spirit of truth is on a di divine plumb line, straight line to get us from point A to point B to point C. And getting us to that place of maturity where we truly can accept the call of God or the placement of God in our lives. Maybe it's just in a local church in which God sees us to be a blessed, anointed, functioning element in a local church. But we can never get there if we're not allowing the spirit of truth to purge us, to guide us, to process us, to become that person that God sees us to be. Somebody say amen. And so the first thing that I talked about was the spirit of truth will bring conviction in our lives. Jesus said it this way. He said, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. It will convict me of all the unrighteousness, all the uncleanness, all the filthiness of the flesh, all these kinds of things. The Holy Ghost will convict me of that. John, once again, the revelator said, we should ha we have a component in us that no man should teach us for we have an advocate. We have an unction from the Father. He's describing that when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth, there are things that we should just already know because it's in violation with the presence of the almighty God that is within us. We shouldn't have to have somebody telling us that fornication is wrong. And we shouldn't have to have somebody tell us that immorality is wrong. And we shouldn't have to have somebody tell us that telling a lie is wrong. Some things are just in violation of the nature of the spirit of truth. So not only does the spirit of truth convict us of what is wrong, but it was also teach us what is right. As we read the word of God, as we sit in church, as we begin to follow after the things of God, some of the, some of the words that we read in the word of God will become so relevant to where I am at that given moment that we will know that is God. And that is God talking to me. And that is God developing me. And that's God leading me. What a powerful, wonderful thing that is to have the spirit of truth. Somebody said, amen. And then we have of judgment. You know, a lot of people in our world today don't even have common sense. Common sense has been totally eradicated by, in our culture, by the duplicity of, of the media, the absolute irreverence and immorality of Hollywood, and the list goes on. And so people are not able to absolutely develop the basic right and wrong that should come from some form of Christian understanding, but rather they are a byproduct of this world. And so God will not only convict us of what's wrong, God will not only teach us of what's right, God will furnish us with a level of judgment that we never could have approached or received on our own. And where he says here is, he says of judgment, for the prince of this world is judged. It's all the gray areas. God can teach us what's wrong. God can teach us what's right. And that's black and white. But what, all the, what about all the gray areas? A lot of people don't have this kind of judgment in the gray areas, even in spiritual religious settings, because it's not taught and exampled from the leadership. But oftentimes it's in the gray areas where you can't get just a clear answer about something. So you have to judge it from a different perspective. For example, where will something lead? Somebody said, well, I don't see anything wrong, wrong with watching television. But then your children are gonna say, why can't we watch movies? And then since we watch this movie, why can't I watch that movie? When you have the kind of judgment that comes from the spirit of truth, you're able to nip things in the bud. You're able to pull it up before it puts roots down. You're able to pull your sword off and hack it off before it becomes a raging monster and destroys your life. These ty this type of connectedness, of connecting the dots on principles is something that requires the spirit of truth. And I thank God for it. Here at Cornerstone, 
we have a certain level of teaching that helps people understand. Oftentimes when people are young in the faith and they're still going through the process of the spirit of truth convicting them of what's right and showing them some of the baby steps of, of convicting them of what is wrong and the baby steps of what is right, sometimes they don't understand the bigger picture of why we do what we do. And so it is the requirement of spiritual practic practitioners and the fivefold ministry to help bring coloration in connecting the dots so that they can help understand the bigger picture. This is normative in an apostolic church. I've heard of some churches where people say, you know what, I'm just gonna let people come to their own level of separation and let people come to their own level of holiness. That's not my job to do. I disagree with that. I believe that it is the role of apostolic ministry to totally give the total panoramic view of dynamics from a biblical perspective so that those understand, I may not be able to totally connect all the dots on that, but in principle, I see what they're talking about in the word of God and I understand because I can see the completeness of the body of Christ in which I'm a partaker of that every week. I understand why women don't cut their hair because it's in the word of God. I understand why we don't go to the world because it's in the word of God. But I understand the blessings and the glory that meets our local congregation every week. And I comprehend that. And so some of these things, it's just more than just an individual receiving the Holy Ghost left with the word of God and just expecting them to arrive at these things. That's silly. We understand that the fivefold ministry is given for the perfection of the saints until we all come together to the unity of the faith. That is the responsibility and the program of the spirit of truth. Somebody say, amen. And so the Bible continues here when it talks about that he will continue to guide us. Not everybody that has the word of God is exercising, exercising proper judgment. Somebody said, well, you know, I, I met somebody um, on the job that, that goes to another church and they use a lot of scripture and it sounds like they know what they're talking about. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's in the alignment with the spirit of truth. I, I had a few scriptures that I knew before I got, excuse me, before I got saved, but they were not in the context of the spirit of truth. What happens, regardless of what denomination you come from or what kind of background you had, once you receive the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth begins to align every one of those scriptures through truth. So you're now looking at them through the, same, through the right lens and they all fall into their proper place. Some scriptures have no business being used as sharing salvation with somebody. I know just here recently, I was talking with a dear friend that kept going to the fact that we're saved by grace through faith. And, and talking about these kind of things. And I said, I believe in all that. But those are comprehensions and understandings after I obey the gospel. And now when you find out that it falls in its right place, you see all things clearly, you see all things through the perspective of the spirit of truth. It is amazing to me how sometimes people overlook the fact that the devil understands scripture. The Bible teaches me in the book of James chapter number two that the devil believes in one God and trembles. The devil quotes scripture. You may remember when Jesus was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Ghost to be tempted of the devil, that the devil used scripture. The devil said, turn these stones into bread. He knew that Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. Jesus immediately responded according to the book of Deuteronomy and said, man shall live, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Satan was trying to get Jesus to misuse scripture and say, you're hungry, just go ahead and use your power. That would have been an abuse of his power. And then the second temptation, when Jesus was led into the temple, Satan quoted Psalm 91 said, cast yourself down, throw yourself over the edge of the roof of the temple and the angels will bear thee up lest at any time thy dash thy foot against the stone. Yes, Satan can use scripture, but that would have gotten Jesus to actually tempt God. So Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Satan can use scripture, but it's completely out of context and it's not being used by the spirit of truth. 
it's being used by error. And then of course, the last one was Satan told him to fall down and worship me and I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus said, thou shall only worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. And so understanding the word of God does not ensure that you're not going to escape the spirit of error. You have to have the spirit of truth that brings all of the word of God into absolute alignment so that it absolutely cuts like a sword because the word of God is sharp, quick, and powerful. Somebody say amen. It is extremely important that we have the spirit of truth. I want to draw our attention to verse number 13. And I wanna show you that the spirit of truth has a gender. Jesus saying, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, shall he speak and he will show you things to come. I wanna tell you why that is so important. Because when we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number two, Jesus, or the, I'm sorry, the apostle Paul is writing to that thunderous church. Listen to what he says here. He says that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letters from us as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a great falling away first, that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now he is talking about the unveiling and the revealing of the Antichrist. You know, there's a lot of people that are focused on end time events right now. The pandemic certainly fits in uh, to the catalog of end time scriptures found in Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter number 21 and Mark chapter number 13. It's easy to place the pandemic in that. And so there's a lot of focus right now on end time events, but the apostle Paul is, is cautioning us that there is, there are some safeguards to know when certain events are going to take place. First of all, he's talking about that there's going to be a great falling away. A falling away from what? Before the man of sin or the son of perdition is revealed. Let's continue to read here in verse number four. The son, this son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sitteth in the temple showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that it might be revealed in his time. So he's saying the Antichrist is coming. He's going to claim to be God. But there's something that is withholding him from being revealed. It's holding back. It is restraining this great event in human history when the Antichrist will be revealed. I'm still talking about the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And I'm in 2 Thessalonians chapter number two. And the apostle Paul is saying, I told you when I was with you, all these things were gonna happen, but there is something that is restraining, that is holding back all of these events from absolutely emerging off the page of the word of God and into human events. And he describes what that is. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he, everybody said he, only he who now letteth will let until he, everybody said he, is taken out of the way. I believe when Jesus described the identity of the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Ghost, which is the comforter, which is the spirit of God, which is the spirit of Christ. According to Philippians 1.19, the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. According to Romans 8.9, uh, the spirit of Christ. According to Romans 8.14, the spirit of God. We could go on all day here. These are all synonymous terms for the Holy Ghost. But the apostle Paul is saying, 
that the thing that is restraining or withholding the Antichrist from emerging onto the stage of human events is none other than the spirit of truth. Remember Jesus said in John chapter 16, when he, the spirit of truth is come, let's continue to read here. It says, for the mystery of iniquity does already work, only he who now lets will let. The Holy Ghost is allowing things to happen and he is restraining human events from taking place. But there's going to come a time just like the spirit of God could not reason or strive with human beings before the judgment of God of Noah's flood. There is a time, there is a period of time right now in which the Holy Ghost that's been poured out on all flesh, the spirit of truth, is trying to lead people to truth. But there's gonna come a time when he is taken out of the way. And then the evil, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, will come in full force. The only thing that's holding back this word now, I'm talking to you uh, here, it's July 21st, 2020. Our entire nation's in pandemonium. Our entire world has been affected by the pandemic. You're seeing, you're seeing uh, absolute, absolute iniquity, absolute self-will, absolute selfishness. You're, you're seeing a rejection of authority. You're, you're looking people that are rejecting the office of the president. There, it's, it's pandemonium in our nation. And the only thing that's holding it back is the spirit of truth. Let's continue to read. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of, come, of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, talking about the Antichrist, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Pastor, I thought you were talking about the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. I am. When the spirit of truth is removed, the spirit of error is going to become global. It's going to become worldwide. There's people in, I know, I've heard from people that said, you know, why can't I just repent when I see the Antichrist? And why can't I just repent when they're asking me to take it the mark of the beast? I believe that if you do not respond to the spirit of truth, when it's your time to receive to the spirit of truth, that you will be engulfed with a spirit of error because the Bible says so. The Bible says that's what's gonna happen. And with all deceivable, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth. Just like it was in Noah's day, the spirit of God striving with man, trying to reason with man, plead with man, work with man. But God saw that the imaginations of men's heart was only evil continually. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error. I believe that we are in a special period of time right now in which truth is reigning supreme, but understands that the time is coming that when truth goes, the church goes. When the spirit goes, everything that was influenced by the spirit of truth will go with it. And now without any restraint, without anything restraining it into human affairs, the Antichrist and Satan will do a work. And the people that couldn't be convinced of truth, the Bible says God will send them strong delusion. God will send it, not the devil, not some church that's not preaching truth, not somebody that's just a rabid sinner that hates God, hates church, hates people, no. God himself will send strong delusion into the earth because they loved not the truth.
Let's pray. Perhaps you're watching out there and you're saying, you know, God's been trying to convict me of things and God's been trying to lead me into things and God's been trying to get me to quit hanging around with this group of people. And God's been trying to get me to let go of that habit. God's been patient with me and he's trying to lead me into greater truth. Why? Why? Because we have to follow the spirit of truth to be ready for the rapture. This is not about the 21st century. This is not about a life of convenience. This is not about a, an American dream and living with all the, all the effortless uh, benefits of living in this country. This is allowing the spirit of truth to make us rapture ready. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the spirit of God. We thank you for the revelations and understandings that the spirit of truth has brought to our lives. God, if there's any family members that are in the world, God, I pray that there's a great awakening through the spirit of truth, arresting the attentions and the minds and the silly pride and the arrogance and the carnality. We pray for a revival of the spirit of truth teaching us what is wrong and teaching us what is right and giving us a supernatural judgment of all the gray areas. We ask it in the name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. You and I are part of the most incredible, absolute incredible opportunity ever given to a mortal. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow morning.